Thanks very much, everyone, for coming. I mean, it looks wonderful uh, outside here in London, if a little chilly, but uh, um, I've just got a, uh, a picture of my uh, back, uh, backyard uh, from my wife where there's several inches of snow. Um, uh, and it kind of reminds me, going back five years, almost to the week, uh, when a few of us went down to the research funders um, for an interview to see whether uh, I build or one of the competing proposals would get funded. And um, uh, there was so much snow forecast, not quite a beast from the east, uh, but uh, that um, myself and Andy Pike, also travelling from Newcastle, actually uh, rearranged our travel uh, at late notice, probably the latest I think I've ever booked uh, uh, an airplane flight, hopped on the EasyJet to Bristol, taxied to Swindon uh, at uh, 11 o'clock in the evening, just so we could be there in person the next day for our interview. And um, uh, uh, it sort of seems fitting, if a little frustrating, uh, that um, snow is once again disrupting uh, iBuild as we, we come towards the end. Um, so perhaps first off, I'd like to talk about um, get this going. Uh, what we kind of mean by uh, this notion of infrastructure business models. Um, and here, uh, the kind of the I build view is very much around this is about creating, delivering, and capturing values over the entire infrastructure life cycle. And we'll say a bit more about that uh, theme in particular, this idea of values. Um, uh, a, a lot of the time over the course of the day. Um, but the choices we make about our business models uh, impact their use, um, the quality and equity of infrastructure provision. If you think about a wholly and exclusively pay-per-use uh, model of infrastructure versus a, a wholly kind of tax-subsidised version, there's very different ways uh, those impact upon the individuals um, or indeed the state in the way that they uh, operate. And our focus in iBuild has been quite different from a lot of the, the, the conversation in the UK recently, that we focus much more on local infrastructure, that infrastructure in our towns, villages, cities, um, and, and indeed regions. And there's a number of reasons for that. I mean, first off, uh, it's off actually what we kind of experience most on our day-to-day -day basis is this local uh, regional infrastructure. Um, it, it really is uh, what determines, I think, our quality of life, that daily service uh, provision. But we also noticed that um, the compound benefits and impacts of these smaller scale infrastructures are often far greater than the very large mega projects that we hear about uh, on the news far more frequently. And indeed, analysis in the US following uh, the Obama stimulus program for infrastructure investment suggested that it was this local uh, and regional infrastructure that actually created more jobs locally than the big national programs of work. Um, and so why, though, did we end up looking at business models? Um, well, there's lots of examples of, of high-profile failures, both within the infrastructure sector and outside. We're probably all... Uh, uh, in this room remember Blockbuster Video, um, something that uh, I think my kids uh, never will uh, know about unless I show them these slides in a few years' time, which they won't really thank me for. Um, but a company dominating the video rental market uh, lost sight of opportunities from uh, ICT provision uh, and collapsed very, very rapidly. Um, the Motorola satellite phone network also uh, launched uh, or created, if you like, on the back of multi-billion dollars of investment, uh, subsequently sold uh, in the order of uh, tens of millions, uh, mainly to the US military as a sort of a backup uh, telecoms network a few years later. Because again, the market and the opportunities from different mobile communications infrastructure had moved on. Um, I could have uh, showed a report from the National Audit Office uh, uh, highlighting and critiquing the problems of private finance initiatives at the start uh, of iBuild. In fact, I probably did. Um, well, not long ago, they highlighted again the problems with the sequel to uh, the first sort of private finance, uh, finance initiative, uh, and that was PIT called PF2. And this is an example of, of a school there in. Um, uh, Edinburgh being torn back down uh, because of the uh, poor 
uh, construction that emerged from that process. Um, our water companies uh, sold off uh, uh, in the 80s uh, have now become huge vehicles for debt. The light blue uh, on the left-hand side of that graph uh, highlighting the equity uh, in all water utilities in the UK uh, and the dark blue showing the debt growing, growing, growing uh, over time. Uh, so um, those of us who live in the northeast uh, are probably more familiar with the East Coast mainline than most of this. Uh, but again, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, the companies running that uh, withdrew from operating the franchise because they overbid uh, to win uh, that, uh, that, that operation. Um, and uh, in New York, following Hurricane Sandy, uh, we saw how business models that create a just-in-time supply chain for food and, other, and fuel and other resources within the city failed because there wasn't the resilience and redundancy uh, in being able to actually deliver those goods uh, to shops and communities. Um, uh, and in New York in particular, about 60% of all food goes through one single location uh, on Hunts Point, uh, uh, which is also uh, rather conveniently in the floodplain. So we're seeing infrastructure business models fail for a number of reasons. They're, they've been letting down uh, individuals, taxpayers, they've been letting down governments, they've been letting down uh, private industry uh, as well. Um, and so uh, what we've tried to do is pull together uh, in a hopefully a relatively accessible format um, key messages and findings and recommendations from the overall iBuild program. And I'm going to try and distill those uh, as, 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 as uh, succinctly as I possibly can, uh, but of course there is an awful lot more there. Some uh, is in this uh, report uh, that hopefully you will have all managed to pick up on the way in, or you can pick up uh, at the next break. Um, uh, and in there we kind of reference back into uh, all of the other documents, materials that Thomas uh, uh, meticulously analysed to, to, to highlight how uh, we've been growing our kind of interdisciplinary connectivity and we're kind of showing that in our, in our outputs as well. Uh, and I'm sure if he'd showed a, a, a kind of a version of that from two years ago, it would have been a far uh, less dense uh, network. So our first kind of key message, adopt a broader, integrated and more holistic appreciation of infrastructure. I will expand on this momentarily. Uh, enable greater action uh, at the local scale that kind of reflects the distinctive nature of each place but also connects with the national. Uh, I said I'd talk about value uh, a lot more, it's going to keep coming up, but facilitate and capture all forms of long-term and indeed short-term value. Um, deliver infrastructure more efficiently with less waste um, uh, by aligning different organisational capabilities, tapping into what people do best but also uh, seeking to apply uh, circular economy principles uh, and accelerate uptake through practical action and demonstration. So when we first started out, uh, I built the, the first question was, <laughs> so, what, what is infrastructure? What do you mean by that? Uh, and uh, uh, one of our colleagues came up with this, bridges and that. <laughs> is it bridges and that? Um, well, infrastructure is we argue far more than bridges than that, and indeed if we just focus on the bridges than that, we miss out opportunities to capture value. Um, uh, that we have to look at not just those assets and components, those bridges and so on, we have to think about the resources that these systems convey, the networks to which they belong, uh, and the services that they provide, the sanitation, comfort, health, uh, uh, mobility, uh, employment, education and so on for uh, us uh, and uh, the wider society. But of course it's not just these components, these are embedded within uh, wider economic and environmental systems uh, and all of these are governed by some form of uh, management regulatory processes uh, and we really need to understand and think about both risks and opportunities across this wider system uh, if we're to open up different uh, um, uh, opportunities and business models. Perhaps one of the things that 
um, I think I personally felt was, was the most obvious thing to do is actually start to think about housing and infrastructure in the same sentence. Um, it amazes me that houses, which are one of the principal centres of demand uh, for infrastructure services, are quite often thought of in an entirely different process to wider infrastructure planning. Um, and indeed, it is often the compound interventions, the aggregation of many interventions across many, many buildings, houses, uh, uh, and so on, uh, that actually impact and mediate uh, the demand on our infrastructure services and indeed possibly some of the other risks uh, and opportunities to them. Um, and so we've kind of referred to those smaller scale interventions as uh, a sort of a hidden infrastructure, uh, something which isn't always there. Sometimes it acts to actually reduce demand on major infrastructure networks, for example, energy efficiency measures. But if we are divorcing conversations about where to invest in one, uh, uh, well, the small stuff and the big stuff, then we will miss out uh, uh, some easy wins and opportunities. Um, and there's an urgent need to really start to break down some of the uh, policy and institutional and regulatory barriers uh, uh, to facilitate a much more integrated approach to uh, local service provision. We often hear about the risks associated with infra infrastructure interdependencies, um, but there are often opportunities from uh, shared spaces, uh, uh, um, transfer of resources, enhanced resilience, and so on. Uh, and so, uh, but regulatory barriers, as we've seen in a number of examples, often really stymie that kind of innovation and integration uh, of, of provision. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if you can hear it, the, ba there's a band playing behind me, but uh, which is rather off-putting. I thought they, they've obviously gone a bit early. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the second sort of key recommendation about enabling local action, one of the things that we thought was really important was actually um, in the same way that we've seen national campaigns for a living wage, um, uh, that this is not just about existing but about living in the way that that, that campaign has put it. We also need to be thinking about ensuring a, a, not a basic level of infrastructure provision, uh, a living uh, uh, level of infrastructure provision, an infrastructure service guarantee that ensures a minimum level of service. Now by this I'm not saying everyone has to be within X miles of a motorway or a, a station because we, if we focus on service rather than engineering design, we can be more innovative in the way uh, that we deliver those services. And so whether that is, for example, through local water treatment, uh, or perhaps getting communities more involved in actually enabling some of those services as they already have done in uh, broadband for the rural north in the northwest uh, where they laid their own infrastructure cables but actually thinking about the appropriate engineering solution for the locality in question uh, and of course this poses real challenges for some of the big uh, uh, pro uh, providers of infrastructure where it's throughput based profit oriented uh, and so on, uh, and actually we need to be far more agile in allowing smaller providers, local innovation, to enable and ensure that everybody has that guaranteed service provision. Um, perhaps, um, this was something I think came as a, a, a bit of a surprise to me, how stark uh, this imbalance of uh, local power and authority uh, was out there. Um, and that if we are to maximise the effectiveness of local infrastructure business models and service provision, uh, we need to see a change uh, in the balance of power between localities uh, and Westminster. Um, uh, there is a very stark difference uh, in uh, how the UK raises its tax base um, compared to many other nations. And so you see, Alan, of all the ones here, um, the UK... Uh, only raises 5% of its tax locally, um, uh, and in fact, it's the only one on, on, on well, other than Denmark where it's a bit more parity. Um, but it's a, a, a big difference between where that money comes from and then ultimately who controls and decides how that is invested. And so, if we are serious about tackling local infrastructure service provision, 
uh, then we need to start shifting uh, some of the balance of uh, funding, taxation, governance, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, that across the nations, we're already seeing some devolution activity, but it's highly inconsistent uh, in its approach. Um, that here we see a range of different sectors in the rows uh, and in the columns, different locations where different degrees of devolution uh, for different sectors are being arranged and negotiated uh, in quite different and inconsistent ways and with very different uh, levels of resources uh, and financial support to actually uh, enable uh, action there. And so we're seeing a very kind of uh, uh, chaotic picture emerging uh, of the devolution that is taking place. And again, something uh, that um, uh, 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 might be appropriate to reflect that difference of locality, um, but actually it's also uh, 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 not really releasing the appropriate resources to enable a lot of the necessary support. So we also need to start thinking, and particularly I think the urgency for this is great, and I, I, I hate to mention um, uh, the Brexit word, but as we are preparing to withdraw from uh, the European Union and with it the European Investment Bank, um, uh, that we will have to think about um, ensuring that we replace that source of uh, financial support for our infrastructure. Uh, and so one of the things that we looked at was uh, a very large number of case studies, uh, a number of which are on the web and many more will be appearing on the web over the, the coming weeks. Um, uh, to uh, understand what's already going on in the world. And it turns out there's, there's far more diversity in funding and financing than perhaps uh, the big infrastructure projects and reports we read about from the National Audit Office uh, would suggest. Um, and our review highlighted a very wide range of mechanisms for value creation, um, a very wide range of organisational structures for operating and, and running businesses and, and infrastructure services, Again, a, a real diversity of funding and finance mechanisms that are out there, many of which, though, are, are, are either particularly niche or perhaps um, uh, uh, taking place in, in different countries under different regimes. And so as we move out of the European Union, I think the, the pressure and the need to open up opportunities and allow different mechanisms for funding, financing, and, and, and creating and harnessing value uh, become ever more uh, pressing. Um, because as um, I said uh, uh, from the outset, uh, that we really need to tap into uh, a far wider set of values. And if we can capture uh, all the values associated with infrastructure, hopefully um, we will be able to tap into improved investment and resources. Because it really is a case of underinvestment in infrastructure springs from our failure to value it properly. And so some of the work that will be explored in this afternoon's uh, workshop uh, is looking at how um, we're actually uh, uh, trying to tap into and understand a wide range of values, not just short-term economic wins, longer-term economic values, but also social, environmental, cultural, health, and so on. Uh, as part of that. And I won't dwell on this because uh, we do have uh, a lot longer uh, to explore these issues later today. Um, today seems like a, a particularly uh, good time to focus on uh, valuing resilience. Uh, I wish I had a picture of uh, some snow now in my, my slides, uh, but I don't. Um, some of the work that we've undertaken in iBuild has been looking at how um, uh, the opportunities from interdependency. We quite often look at risks associated with cascading failures and black swan events and so on. But actually, um, we've seen how uh, uh, one opportunity from interdependence is from kind of dual use uh, or adaptable infrastructure. Um, some examples are on the images there. Uh, roads that can become runways in, in the outback uh, for the flying doctor services. Electric vehicles, perhaps the uh, uh, the most obvious and visible of our kind of dual-use infrastructures uh, where a vehicle might also become a battery uh, in times of, of, of uh, uh, low kind of power generation across the grid. Um, and in Kuala Lumpur in the bottom there, a tunnel that 
uh, acts as a tunnel, uh, like many do, road tunnel. Um, uh, but during uh, uh, monsoon uh, events, uh, also acts as a large, deliberately acts, and, and is designed to act as a large stormwater drain. Uh, and there's a sort of a CCTV image there you might be able to make out um, of uh, uh, the tunnel filling up with water. Uh, and so one of the things that we looked at was how, uh, looking at the um, uh, graph at the, the bottom there, if we have uh, one network uh, and we've got this one of these dual-use uh, assets um, uh, and maybe there's some event like a flood, we transfer it over from being part of the road network into a storm drain tunnel. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the kind of the, the light grey wedge in the, the uh, middle of that um, box diagram plot shows uh, the failed proportion of the infrastructure, but the dark grey wedge at the bottom shows that how actually introducing some of these uh, adaptable infrastructure components into our network can actually uh, enable a larger proportion of it to remain viable even during the most extreme events. And so if we identify critical locations within our infrastructure systems and provide that flexibility, perhaps drawing it from other networks, uh, we can uh, potentially enhance our resilience uh, um, uh, more cost effectively. So over the years we've seen, and, and particularly as austerity bites our local authorities, we have seen a, a real ramping up in the sale of public assets. Uh, this is a farm um, overlooking uh, Beachy Head. Uh, uh, the for sale sign was actually added uh, image, but uh, uh, this was sold uh, not too long ago uh, as uh, one of the local council's uh, very large asset selling exercises. And we've seen a, um, in the last few years an almost doubling uh, of the proportion of public assets that are sold. Well, this creates short-term windfall benefits, of course, uh, but over the longer term actually um, uh, can have a significant uh, diminishment uh, of capability and resources, and so actually leads to a far less sustainable financial situation. Uh, some of the work uh, done by my colleagues has been looking at uh, how resource assessments uh, enable local councils to tap into, in this case, uh, local energy provision uh, and actually uh, 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 provide profits uh, from that local energy provision. This is an example from Leeds um, uh, of the Glasshouse um, Hostel uh, where uh, it's now covered in solar and uh, wind generation. Um, and so this needs to be coupled as part of a much more holistic approach uh, to infrastructure economics, really thinking, coming back to this, this point about the system and what we're trying to provide. Uh, and we'll hear more about that um, later in the day uh, as well. Those uh, in the uh, civil engineering industry should be familiar with the project initiation route map, um, a really nice uh, example of trying to map organisational capabilities with the delivery process and um, uh, it's, it's been fascinating to hear from some of our international advisory board members of how uh, this uh, um, document and, and uh, best practice has actually been picked up in a number of places uh, around the world. Um, uh, again, uh, uh, work in uh, Leeds uh, has been looking at how this can be scaled out to thinking about applying the same principles to uh, city-wide system scale infrastructure provision. Um, and they've developed a, a really nice bit of, uh, bit of work in conjunction with another project, uh, one of the kind of EPSRC, RC UK, urban living uh, program uh, projects, uh, to actually look at how you build uh, local organize or match, match local organizational capabilities um, and start to diagnose and then uh, uh, plan to tackle uh, these issues at the sort of scale of, of cities. We hear a lot about the circular economy and how we need to reduce waste, recycle and so on. Uh, I think one of the things that I really like uh, about the work, and we're going to, I think we're going to hear more about this later uh, from Eleni as well, uh, is that we, when it comes to infrastructure, if we're building something and we then 
invest a lot of energy and uh, resources in the cement, concrete, and so on, uh, and then demolish it, uh, uh, break it all down into aggregates, only then to reconstitute it uh, uh, from the outset. Uh, we're just kind of adding in more and more energy demand at each cycle and iteration of that. Um, here, um, uh, uh, colleagues at least have taken a different approach, thinking about actually the components and how uh, those could be uh, reused and designed from the outset uh, to be far more, uh, uh, if you like, um, reusable uh, uh, in a much more holistic way so that we don't end up just adding more and more layers of energy use to each iteration of our construction cycle. Uh, and these sort of system scale approaches, thinking about this across the whole life cycle uh, of components and systems, uh, again, uh, uh, resonates with the sort of the I build uh, approach. So where do we go from here? Um, there's a lot of work, a lot of nice new methods and ideas, um, but actually uh, we think it's actually really crucial to be trialling out some of these. Um, this is uh, the Newcastle site, Central site, it was formerly where uh, Newcastle Brown Ale was brewed. You can just about see the football stadium uh, in the top of the image. Uh, and it's one example of a number of locations uh, in each of the I-Build cities, Birmingham, uh, Leeds, and Newcastle, uh, where we're seeing demonstrations of innovative technologies delivered and taking place on a sector-by-sector -sector basis in isolation. And the challenge that we kind of pose is how can we bring these together and actually use these as test beds for trialling uh, uh, innovations in interdependencies, innovations uh, in uh, business models and planning and so on. Uh, um, we think that uh, uh, actually the uh, site here in Newcastle, uh, the um, application of the, the true tool that I showed earlier in Leeds uh, and the Tisley uh, Energy Park in Birmingham offer three such uh, innovation uh, opportunities for really demonstrating not just advances in the physical infrastructure systems uh, and how they might integrate, uh, but also um, the business models as well. Uh, and so in that, uh, it's the challenge to trialling, not just the physical, but also uh, the, the, the kind of the, the uh, social and economic approaches. Um, and, and so, if you like, to give some flavour of what I'm trying to mean by that, here is uh, uh, um, uh, an archetype diagram of the current infrastructure business model for uh, energy um, and two different ways uh, of how that might evolve moving forward. Uh, one, uh, a kind of multi-utility service company, one, a municipal or, uh, utility approach, um, provide two different types of business models that might lend themselves to application and actually unlocking opportunity in these sorts of sites uh, around the country. And so we are suggesting trialling the physical, the social, uh, and the uh, economic. Over the years, we've been working hard across the whole team uh, to try and uh, embed some of these ideas uh, in policy, practice, uh, and so on. Uh, there's just an example of, of some of the work that we've done uh, in that domain uh, on this slide, whether that is with uh, central government, local government, uh, uh, or in industry partners uh, working often uh, uh, jointly and, 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 and through secondments uh, to actually apply and trial out some of these methods uh, to really see whether they work. Um, and uh, this image, which is in the back of the report, just distills where we are at the moment. There's still a lot more uh, outputs and activities that are being written up uh, as we speak, uh, but there's a large number of case studies. We've looked at a huge number of infrastructure business models, um, uh, written a lot of publications as academics tend to do. Um, but that, of course, is the motivation behind this report, is we try to really distill down the key messages uh, and essence of a lot of those uh, and allow people to explore those areas in more detail, chase up uh, papers, outputs, and so on in more detail uh, uh, at their own time, focusing on what they're interested in. And you'll find on the memory stick you should have received when you, you walked in as well, uh, all of those outputs to date, uh, and there should be uh, more appearing in due course. But I think perhaps 
just picking up on the point Tom made uh, at the outset, one of the things uh, that I think it's fair to say uh, all of my colleagues uh, are most proud of uh, is the uh, wonderful uh, research fellows and PhD students who uh, uh, have, have really got stuck into tackling this interdisciplinary challenge. Uh, so many of them, uh, in fact eight in all, have been promoted uh, from research associates to uh, full-time academics over the course of the project, which of course is a project management headache, but an absolute joy to, uh, to, to behold. Um, uh, with four uh, external fellowships as well, uh, on top of that, um, we've seen uh, a real kind of uh, wonderful, uh, if you like, um, I suppose it's, it's uh, uh, support for what we've been doing uh, through their career progression and advancement and everything that they've achieved as part of this. So over the course of the day, uh, we're going to hear more detail about a few aspects of the project. There's some posters uh, in the room at the back, so when you get your food, do kind of wander around and see those. We couldn't put the food and posters together for reasons of space. Um, and take the opportunity, please, to talk to uh, many other people from the team uh, who are here uh, and who will offer uh, far more detail and, and sense about many of the things that I've uh, tried to consolidate uh, in this talk today.